Um, it's really good to see you. How are you? I'm very good. I'm in Berlin. It's snowing, rainy-ish, something like that. And it's really great, but I'm, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> uh, for those of you, uh, our dear viewers, who have not recognized our guest yet, it's obviously Paula Beer. Beer, Bear. I mean, it's always so difficult to say. Uh, so the proper would be, of course, be Beer, right? Well, in German, it's Beer, but... Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't mind if someone pronounced it like beer. Um, how many, uh, how many, uh, you know, very poor quality jokes about your last name in English do you get? Some or uh, none? Well, well, yeah, sure, some. But normally it's related to, oh, I like your name. I like beer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that's fine. <laughs> that sounds like a very cheesy pickup line, by the way. I yeah. hope. Okay, I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> that doesn't happen too often. All right, so um, we're talking obviously because it's another edition of uh, German Film Week here in, in Poland, here being a very abstract term these days. Yeah. Um, and Undine, uh, your latest film directed by Christian Petzold is uh, screening uh, in the program. And obviously congrats uh, on the film. Uh, it's brought mm -hmm. you uh, an acting award in, in Berlin. Uh, yeah uh which which is which is always great um but even if it didn't it would be equally amazing uh experience um but before we move on to talking about the movie and christian petzold who's of course no stranger to uh our viewers i would like to use this uh opportunity to just give our viewers a little bit of behind the scenes uh mm -hmm. with you so uh, I'm just going to ask you uh, the most popular question any actor ever gets. Just Perfect. brace yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what brought you to acting? When and when did you know that, you know, sort of a childhood fantasy is going to become uh, your life? Um, well, first time acting was definitely in first so you say first grade, well, when you're five, six, your first year in school. And we prepared a little piece for, for the new first class students. And I was a dragon and I had a few lines and I was really, I was really excited to, to have a costume and to, to say some lines. And then I, I changed school and I wanted to continue um, theatre, but that was actually because my, my two best friends went to the theater program in our school. I was like, well, if they go there, they normally don't have time after school. So I joined them in the, in the course. And that's, that was the first time I was on stage and um, I was eight um, in a real theater and real proper costumes, proper audience and proper theater. And there I realized that I really love being on stage, telling a story and forgetting that you're yourself, but you become a role and you tell a story for the audience. And that kind of fascinated me. Um, and then, yeah, a few years passed. And then when I was 12, I, I told my mom that I want to continue acting. And I started in the Friedrich Stadtpalast in Berlin, which is a review theater. And it's, it's a huge stage and 4,200 people. So it's, it's really huge. And especially if you're 12, you're tiny on the huge stage. Yeah. And that was, yeah, I think the beginning of the understanding, I, I love that and I want to continue doing that. And actually, um, movie started really by accident because the casting director from a movie saw me on school because they were searching for the, uh, for the main character. So they went to every school in Berlin and were looking for, for girls yeah. in the age. Um, they invited me for the cast for the audition and then I got that part and that's kind of how I got into into movies and by that movie I got to know my agent and when I was close to finishing school she said if you want to continue you kind of have to learn this profession and yes. then I decided to have a, a free um well I was working with coaches and different teachers but I didn't go to to drama school and then I never really had the question of, do I want to do something else? But yeah. just, uh, I wanted to understand more about the job and how, how film acting works. 
and that's how it all like continued. Mm. So officially, your film debut is Paul. I guess that's, yeah. that's that's the original title. And when you were doing that movie, you were fourteen, I think. Yeah. Which uh, I mean, I know that actors. Some actors start at three, right? But mm. I mean, fourteen is a very tricky age in every person's mm. life. I would say, especially in a woman's life. So I wonder if we were to go back to that moment and you sort of becoming a professional actress in that time, how, how did it feel? And like, what image of you, you know, in this business did you have at that point? Um, well, for me, because I never did movies before and I didn't really know how movies were done. Um, so I didn't really have a, a like, a, I didn't know what to expect. So I went there and it was in my summer holidays and I had two weeks uh, off before summer holidays and two weeks after summer holidays, so like three months. And I was on the plane to Estonia realizing, I don't really know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> I got so it, what does it mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that was a real adventure. And um, I was really lucky to have such a great director who really took care of me. and who wrote the script and he knows every detail by heart so he was a huge help to to guide me through that and i think because it was a historical movie plus they built this awesome set with a house in the sea and then you have this laboratory i guess i think you say with yeah. so her father is a, is a, a brain scientist and he has all those crazy things in, in glasses everywhere like embryos and mm. hearts and whatever so it was really creepy but so fascinating to come to a world that you would never be able to to be at so i think that these three months were really really an adventure of, of playing and of not really understanding oh that okay i have a lot of pressure they they want to have a good movie but for me it was really like having fun and um, being surrounded by by great adults. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had a bigger pause until my second movie. I think it was 16. Um, so I did only one, one movie d uh, during school after that one. And then I had the next one right after school. Um, yeah, and I think, well, I don't know how, what people thought of me when, when, when they saw my first movie or what, yeah, where I was. I think it took quite a while until, um, or I had this impression that in, in the working with directors, until I realized, okay, now I think I'm an actress because before you're more like a child, um, child actor, and mm -hmm. and I think you're a bit treated differently if you're the child actor. And then at one point I realized, oh, now they're asking me what I think about scenes and. Ooh. So, you know, it starts a bit to that they understand, okay, you, you know how, how that works and understand reading scripts and analyzing them. I think that's the, um, when I understood, okay, I think now, now I'm an adult actress. Yeah, being an adult has its pluses and its minuses, let's be honest, but definitely <laughs> acting wise, this is, this, is, this is a good thing. So we're jumping through the timeline, of course, as, 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 as usual, but then we have the breakthrough year for you, which is 2016 and, and France, an amazing role that brought you um, uh, the best debutant uh, act, uh, award in, in Venice, um, a, very, a very, very prestigious award named by the great uh, Marcello Mastroianni. Um, and I think basically ever since you've been, uh, how do we say that in English? In Polish, we say on mouth of everybody, you know, like mm -hmm. everybody, <laughs> every, everybody's, everybody's uh, uh, talking about you. So did you really feel that like a sort of a seismic shift in, in your career? Everything started going faster after that? Mm. Well, not really. I think... Um, well, of course, I, I, I was so lucky to have great, great scripts and great directors who wanted to work with me or asked me to come to castings. Um, that, that's for sure. But the, it's always a bit, it's weird because being in the position of um, getting the award is so, you, you don't, until today, I didn't 
I don't really realize that. It's, it's still that, wow, this award, and, but I got it, so it's like, me? Oh, wow, okay. So uh, it's really because, so I think, so, so big, some things are so supernatural that you don't really understand them if you're in the situation. But for me, nothing really changed. It's more the, the people look different at you. Yeah. And I think what happens a lot that, I mean, it's, it's amazing to get awards, don't get me wrong, and it's a huge honor. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's changed a bit how people look at you and that sometimes means they expect you to, to be working so much they, they can't even ask. So that led a bit that to me being free for a year, then a year and a half. So I had huge breaks, which was good for my work as well. But it's not that you get an award and then suddenly you, you're just working, working for years and you don't have mm -hmm. a break. Um, but that, that's interesting what you're saying, because I actually never thought about that, that people think you're so in demand and so popular and yeah. so sort of out of reach that they might be afraid to, uh, you know, suggest a part yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's both. I mean, of course, they, they, I think they realize you or get to know your work by an award because they're like, oh, she got that. I, I'm going to watch the movie. Mm -hmm. And then again, so it had both sides, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 um so we're slowly moving to uh undine and while we do that i'm gonna do a lot of great pr because i think talking about success is something we should always do for ourselves and maybe <laughs> for others but for ourselves first of all so um after france there was transit your first collaboration with Christian, uh, Christian Petzold, uh, mm -hmm. director of Undine. Uh, then uh, we had the German um, Oscar candidate uh, from Florian Henkel von Donnersmark, uh, Never mm -hmm. Look Away, an amazing movie, which we will not talk about today, but we did have that film, um, mm -hmm. I think, la la last year. Uh, then there was a French collaboration, another one, The Wolf's Call, and also your big commercial success TV series, Bad Banks. Mm -hmm. uh, which I assume also in a way changed the way people see you because this is what TV yes. I think does. And then we have Undine, uh, which uh, is a film that you know reflects on a motive that's been worked on by culture several times, including ballet, mm -hmm. opera, even uh, our uh, well-renowned Polish romantic writers, uh, you know, picked uh, picked that motive and and reinterpreted it. So. When you got the script, um, how, I don't know, surprising, refreshing uh, was the attitude that, the, the approach that Christian had to, to that mm. motive? Uh, uh, yeah, how, how did you see it? Um, well, he first talked to me and Franz about that story while we're shooting Transit. And he said, well, that could be the next idea for my, or the idea for my next movie. So I kind of knew a bit about the story. Mm -hmm. And then I got the script and, um, yeah, it was really funny. I was sitting in a cafe in, in Frankfurt um, and I was starting to read it. And I had like, the script was like that because I don't know, something was wrong with the printer. And, <laughs> well, <laughs> the script. and then I read it and I really got, well, I, I lost myself a bit in this world and then I went to the last page and I was a bit like Odin, like coming back to the earth again, being like, oh, wow. So, and I don't have that so, so often that you get really lost in, in, the, in the story and in, in the world that's created within that book. Um, so I, I directly called Christian and said, I, I love the script and then I would love to play Odin. Um, and yeah, I, I, I love his way of bringing a myth and a fairy tale to a modern world and mm -hmm. connecting these two worlds without being in a cliche of the mermaid the woman and long hair and long gowns or whatever, but mm -hmm. more like a modern woman stuck with the curse of, of Undine. And I mm -hmm. think that's, that was for me so interesting to combine two worlds that on the first look, maybe are so not matching. Mm -hmm. And then you understand it's really, I love fairy tales. I, I, when I was small, I always watched the old Russian and 
um, Czech um, fairy tales. And I love all this. Yeah, I love I love these tales. And I think they, we lose these stories a bit. And, and it's always so, um, it has to be so efficient and so fast. And I love that about fairy tales, but they don't really have a timeline. And mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they still work because you understand these archetypal yes, yes, yes. feelings and problems. Yeah, yeah. But it was interesting what you said about a modern woman with the curse because uh, watching a movie, I had this feeling that these days, still, sadly, femininity and being a woman is often a curse by itself, <laughs> yeah. even if you don't have an extra one, you know? So yeah. Yeah. How, how did you talk with Christian about this character? You know, who is she? Where is she? Uh, because it seems he's, he's also so precise with his scripts always. So I wonder how, how, how did you describe, you know, the nature of, of Undina? Um, well, we were talking a lot about that, of like how modern is or how normal or how how much of this water creature. Um, and then I think we kind of find out that for her, love means something different and that you don't say that. Or that it's not so so fast like in, in our days today, like with with apps or, um, mm -hmm. how do you say that, pa partner apps, <laughs> um, where you're so, so used to, to meet someone that says, oh no, I'm not interested, she looks better. I think we're a better yeah. match. Um, and that that doesn't work for her. If if you say you love me, that means you love me yes. forever. And I love her. I mean, in, the, in a way, it's really cruel and and to be so um, resolute. But I think to be so, in, it's naive as well, and and so mm -hmm. um, so open for for. That, that feelings can break your heart. Mm -hmm. And I think to, to, to be able to love is such a, yeah, you have to be able to love someone and to, to let someone be himself and like Undina does, like to let someone go because you love them. Mm -hmm. And I think so, I mean, she has this curse and it's connected to, to brutality, br brutal, um, yeah, she, she is really brutal and really mm -hmm. um, dangerous. But I think that's not her choice, but that's the curse. And yeah. she's, she just loves. And her hope and her, like getting always disappointed by men, always, she always needs to get, go back to water. Mm -hmm. And then she's back with a new man. And there's always hope for, for something better. And yes. this time, it's going to be all fine. And I think that's a huge strength. Uh, strength and, that fascinated me a lot because yeah. it's so today. Yeah, we, we can just remind uh, our viewers that in the original uh, Nord Nordic mythology, uh, it was about uh, this water creature who lived in lakes or rivers and if, uh, and they didn't have a soul, um, I think. And yeah. so they could meet an earthly uh, guy and if they fall in love, they would become mortals but then they, yeah, would, they, they would gain the immortal soul but also if the partner was unfaithful they had to die which yeah. uh which uh, is connected to what you were talking about because i think the film also shows that there is um, a notion of responsibility that love mm -hmm. is also about responsibility whatever it means and i think in the era of dating apps that you've mentioned this issue is not really something we talk about anymore yeah. right yeah absolutely yeah so that that's also interesting but something i wanted to ask you about is the the diary or the notebook because you've already revealed <laughs> that you often write uh, diaries for your characters and yeah. i really want to know how did undina's diary look like because that must have been crazy <laughs> yeah, yeah that's true and that was so fun about that that character because normally I mean, sure, you can can work with more archetypal things to make it more rich or enriching your 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 character. Mm. But I think it's always quite. It has to be quite normal in the end, and you shouldn't see that you're prepared to be 
I don't know, a cream, but actually just a, a guide. Um, and for Undine, that was different because she had this mermaid aspect. So I was working a lot on, on this fairy tale world to, well, to understand a bit more that for her, some things mean different um, than for, for human beings. And that's fun to play someone who's not totally human. Um, so yeah, I mean, my, my, I don't always have these like written diaries for, um, it's, um, yeah, I think every character chooses a bit what they need for preparation, but I always have lots of papers and a book where everything is inside. So sometimes it's just thoughts, my thoughts about scene, sometimes it's scene analysis, sometimes it's really like in the monologues from my characters. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're drawings. So it's, yeah, yeah. it's really different. I know this is just a side note, but, and I should know that actors do transform for the parts, but just looking at you now, uh, I, I go back to this, the styling of, of your character and how she looks like, you know, a creature from Botticelli's uh, painting with those <laughs> yeah. red curls. And um, just a quick one, uh, was the image of her something that you discussed? Because she does have a particular look. She has sort of two uniforms, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, in the beginning we were thinking about is she, does she have like white hair um, or red hair? Because I think these are the watercolors you would use for, for water creature. And then we decided to go for the ginger red style because we were a bit afraid that if I have this platinum blonde hair and we were shooting underwater and there's claw inside, and it can happen that your hair becomes green. So um, oh, we went for the, for we the, don't want that. <laughs> so we went for the wet style. And also there would be the Daryl Hannah connection if you went for blonde. Yeah. That's yeah. risky. Yeah, true. Yeah, and yeah. So I, I'm happy we, we went for the curly ginger version. Um, mm. Yeah, and it's always, because you, you well you can always think about maybe she's blonde maybe she has black hair maybe straight maybe curly maybe um maybe um, french no oh, french yeah. yeah yeah bangs french yeah um but then you i had that once um and they wanted to to dye my hair blonde and then they were blonde and then we were like that came out different. <laughs> so <laughs> you never know how the hair reacts and how the style really fits you personally. Mm -hmm. So it's always a very interesting uh, search to, to find the character. And mm -hmm. yeah, maybe you have the idea she's blonde, but then you realize, oh, that doesn't work with your skin tone. So you have to find another solution. But for me, it always helps a lot too, mm -hmm. to morph a bit in your... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actors, actors often say that, that the physical aspect helps you to sort of dive deeper. Yeah. Uh, I can understand that. But in, in this film, what was help helpful was that you've already known uh, Christian and you've already yeah. known Franz, who's, who's your screen uh, partner here. And I want to ask you about Christian's process because this is something mm -hmm. you've all also talked about, that he has a particular sort of work ethic and work rhythm, which might seem a bit scary at first, but then it turns out to be extremely effective. So yeah. how was it with, with this movie? Um, well, Christian is, he's really precise about things, but he trusts a lot. So if he has chosen someone, I think he trusts them to 100% and let them do their, their part, um, which is quite fascinating to have someone who's not controlling all the time. Um, so he chooses his, his crew and then um, during preparation he gets all the actors together because he wants to create this feeling you have in theatre, I think more often, of being an ensemble and that mm -hmm. you're not only an actor coming to set. If yes. you have a smaller part, you're there for two days, you know nobody and then you leave. But he wants everyone to be together and then he always selects the movies that for him work for for something in the new movie he's gonna do. So like when he said, this reminds me of that, or I want this feeling 
to be part of, of our movie. Mm -hmm. He shows us movies, uh, we discuss them, um, he talks about books, about... He's really connected to arts. Um, and he shares a lot about his, his point of view, so you get the possibility of, to understand what, what he thinks and what he sees in his script. And then uh, during shooting, the, a normal day doesn't, well, he, he's not one of the, the early, early birds. I think our days start at eight, not at four in the morning. Nice. Um, really nice. <laughs> and then the actors start and go to costume, have their costume go to set, and then we rehearse only the director, uh, also Christian Petzold, um, her, his assistant, and all the actors and then we rehearse as long as it takes for for the scene then the whole crew comes to the set and has a look at, at the scene and then the actors go to makeup and while we are in makeup the the crew prepare the set mm -hmm. and then we start to shoot and because we were rehearsing before normally christian only does one take um and then you pr proceed to the next angle and mm -hmm. i think a day is over at five or six so he's really efficient in his incredibly yeah. yeah but the funny thing is that if you hear that maybe you could think oh wow that this must be super stressful to um to rehearse and then this and then you shoot and done but it's it's always really relaxed because i think his crew knows him for such a long time that yeah. they just know the the rhythm mm -hmm. so it's i that was so funny because during undine um, because I had so many days of shooting, I still was like, well, it doesn't feel like a, like a day of shooting because normally you have like huge hours a day. And then I realized, oh yeah, but, but that, that's fun <laughs> to work like that. And yeah, I think you feel if you're relaxed and you know each other and you trust each other, mm -hmm. you, you're more likely to experience and to yeah, well, maybe to act a bit more free and without pressure. Mm -hmm. So with this I mean, movie, did you also have a chance to watch movies in the evening? Because I remember when you were uh, talking about transit, you said that Christian uh, is a huge cinephile and that working with him is also like getting an extra film uh, education. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, true. yeah, we did that during transit because we were all in the same hotel um, and our um, DOP had his a beamer so we always were watching movies on his on his balcony and this while well, doing undine i can't remember if we did but that maybe that's <laughs> maybe, i think we didn't i think because we were so separated because we were shooting in in west germany and it's it's really like it's it's a city but it's divided in so many small parts and mm -hmm. you have to drive by car between these mm -hmm. small parts it was a bit tricky to get oh no we, we did watch movies not that often because we were in different hotels but mm -hmm. we did yeah. so um i want to ask you about uh the city because berlin is also somewhere in the background of this movie and we have mm -hmm. a story of undina but on the other hand we have the story of the city that's you know been morphing and transforming over years how do you see the role of berlin in this film and and the relationship between um, the city the architectural aspect the space and, yeah. and the story of your character um well if you see the story that undine is a creature from water and she has she's working in the in the museum as a guide and talking about the um, uh, history of berlin and i always thought it's that's a bit the modern siren call that she she does not have to learn that because she, she's always been there she was always in the water and berlin is built on on a place where i don't know how you say that in english if the water, uh, the earth is really like watery and um, mm -hmm. muddy. Yeah. And then swamp? Water, is it a yeah, swamp? Yeah, 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 exactly. So um, Berlin is built on a swamp. So if you see in that sense, Undine has been there before the humans arrived. And then they came and started to settle out and build, build a city. So she always 
has been in contact with a city and, and saw it build and be destroyed and build up again. And I like that, that she's kind of a, like a bit like a fairy and like always being there and looking for if everything's all right. And, and yeah. I think it's so fascinating about her that she, she, she talks about that, that the limb was destroyed and then reconstruct and then again, something destroyed. Mm -hmm. She knows all this nonsense in history and still she loves people and the city. Yeah. And that's such a huge um, capability to, to love something that is so, so nonsense and doesn't, doesn't learn from its fault. Yeah. You get to have a pretty intense scene with a water creature that's called <laughs> Big Gunther. <and laughs> he is a catfish. So mm -hmm. can we get behind the scenes on that? Does Big Gunther exist? Well, I think they have these huge creatures for real in, in the lake. Well, we, our underwater scenes were not shot in the lake because you wouldn't see anything. <laughs> of course, yeah. Magic uh, of cinema, yeah. Yeah, well, no, it's really fascinating how, how muddy and, yeah, dirty lakes are, so you don't see anything. Uh, but I think they have these huge uh, fish there. Um, and we shot in, in Babelsberg, and they built this huge tank. Um, I don't know how big it was. It's quite, it's quite big. And then you have uh, black walls with all this little cross on, so they can build the sea or the lake um, there yeah and I, I was really yeah it was it was so great to to dive in in this area because they everything you see in the movie they really built underwater and we had all these plans and um and that was yeah it was like diving in a dreamland and having all these these plants and going around and shooting underwater is really it's it's really funny because it, it it takes so much time because it's so slow and yeah water is such a slow element and you you can't move fast even if you want to you're like <laughs> yeah and sometimes <laughs> you, know, you, you have to move the plant more to the right because yeah, yeah. the image and then it's like <laughs> yeah and taking the plant and the plant's not like you put it there but it's like this and it yes. takes like five minutes yeah, <laughs> position, and then you have to wait until the, all the the air bubbles are gone. So it's really it's really slow shooting underwater, um, and that was really really fun too. I think we had four days underwater. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah. hope you are a good swimmer, and that it didn't come with any sort of you know uh, claustrophobia or anything. No, luckily no, no. I mean. I do feel that it's for me it's weird to be in a in a pool underwater and breathing sure. through through a thing and to trust that thing then they will come water uh, air inside and not water or so I, in the beginning it is really tricky to mm. to trust that process but mm -hmm. then it's so much fun to because you get so weightless and if you yeah. breathe in you go a bit up. And then you're like, oh, my my partner just breathed out and <laughs> keep moving yeah. in different directions. It's, yeah, it's there really is something fun. magical to it. I think yeah. it, it's it really yeah. works in the movie. So um, the film, uh, except for its festival success, it was put on several best of 2020 lists in this very weird year. Yeah. So <laughs> how did it feel for you this journey uh, with a film that you know back in February was basically doomed to be a huge success but then the world stopped and everything changed yeah I mean I, I don't really care so much for for the numbers or the success of the movie but of course I was really sad for I don't know for Undine I think that it had such a good start and like the Bolinari like give it like yeah. such a good life and we went to Paris for for the press and while we were in Paris they decided we can't release the movie so and then all the the shutdown started yeah and that was just weird um but yeah I, I mean it's it's for I think for for the production and for the distributor it's 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 really horrible for me as an actor I mean 
yeah, for me, my, my work is a bit done and I help the people like the movie, but their work is putting it or bringing it in the world. So that is really horrible. And, but still, I, I, I hope that, yeah, that people will see the movie and if not that movie, that they will continue going to cinema and that maybe this time being at home and, and living with, with um, streaming platforms, that after all this, maybe one day, hopefully will end, that as we understand that cinema is not only watching movies, but it's a social event and, yes. and that watching movies in a, in a room with different people and sensing them and, and being like, oh, oh yeah, he's laughing. I'm not, that's funny. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so, that makes it so special and to, I mean, to have a screen like that and the, the, um, the speakers are so different and you, you can really get lost in a movie. Yeah. You can't if you're at home and you, you look at your mobile phone and yeah. check your messages in yeah. between. So, I miss yeah, that very much. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yes. Cinema, I think there is a true element of meeting, of interaction, even if you are alone uh, in, in, in the room, you know, when the darkness sheds, yeah. it's a little bit like you're in uh, a psychiatrist's seat. Yeah. But also with friends, it's just such a weird moment of sort of communion. Yeah, yeah I really... And I think it's so funny that, I, I, because I go a lot uh, to the cinema alone, and it's, because sometimes people ask me, how can you go to the cinema on your own? Isn't, it, isn't that weird? The, the best. <laughs> what and do you mean? Because in the moment it gets dark, I, I kind of forget about feeling myself because then I, I'm, I'm part of the movie mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, yeah I think that's so fascinating that human beings are able to forget their reality for an hour and a half or two hours mm -hmm. and follow a story a fictional story and mm -hmm. they have feelings I think that's really fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. So I'm going to move on to my very last question because I, I don't want to keep you uh, too long. And, um, you know, every year uh, during the German Film Week, um, we talk about how the selection of the movies, which is very varied from, you know, more, more popular titles, comedies through, you know, um, dramas with festival success or more art, art house films how the selection shows Germany, contemporary mm -hmm. Germany in a way, you know, how films can reflect the social changes, the shift, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the tendencies. And I wonder for you as a participant, you know, as someone who is in this business, what do you think uh, German cinema is saying uh, about Germany to, today? Um... Well, I'm thinking a lot about that, like how is our society portrayed in our movies? Um, because I think we still have a huge lack of, uh, of diversity in our movies and that still male characters are more normal and more often. Yeah. And I, th I feel that it starts to change. I think um, it, took a, it took a while from yeah, from, from I think maybe starting with the Me Too debate, um, that, that is, I don't know, I think um, it started, uh, um, um, I don't know how to put it, um, but I think people started to talk about it. Okay. And now we have, I think, the tendency of, um, of being like, we need, uh, we need to be diverse and we need strong female characters. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not totally agreeing with that, um, but I think it's, it's a good step to to go in that direction because I think well I, I would find it really sad if women would only be um, worth of telling if they're strong because I think that's that's not true um, but I think it's a good step to say we, we need more characters that are strong and we don't need more of these um, um, girlfriend girlfriend from or what um, yeah. from um so i think it's a good good thinking um and to make it more diverse but still i think it's it's really male and white and mm. not totally what's happening and 
in, 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 in Germany or at least in Berlin. Mm. I so think we, there is a contrast between reality and movie. Yeah, absolutely. So we can say that in a way Undina is like a, this new era character because even though she draws from, you know, like an archetype and a, and a legend, she is a woman who's strong and very vulnerable yeah. and she is independent. Uh, yeah. So I would take that as a good sign for the future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think there are lots of good signs. <laughs> well, um, I wish you all the best with everything that's, uh, that's ahead of you. And I hope, you know, the, the crazy situation which we are in is not impacting you too, too heavily. I know the, the, I think the film business in Berlin is sort of working, uh, of course, yeah. with some changes, but it's working. So, um, well, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for the nice interview. Mm-hmm.